We stand in your holy presence as our supreme teacher. We thank you for all the gifts that we have received, the gift of life, the gift of well-being, and the gift of connection. We humbly bow down before you to bless and inspire us so that everything we think, say, and do will be in accordance with your will. Enlighten our minds. Strengthen our spirits and fill our hearts with love, wisdom, and understanding so that we can become effective channels of truth, growth, inspiration, and peace. In our activities today, guide us in the path of righteousness for the fulfillment of your greater glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. On behalf of the Search Committee, we would like to welcome everyone to the public forum for the Search for the next UP College of Law Dean. The Search Committee is a fact-finding committee whose job is to gather all information considered useful for decision making. But more important than just gathering and recording information, the search committee shall provide a frank assessment of the nominee's suitability for the position. For the composition of the search committee, the chancellor constitute the search committee whose members shall be drawn from outside the unit. Under Administrative Order Number ECLV 23157, the constitution of the Search Committee for the Deanship of the College of Law was formed. I would like to introduce to you the Search Committee, headed by yours truly, Professor Jurkipliwadi, Dean of the UP Institute of Islamic Studies. Also with me today 
our other members of the search committee, namely, Professor Dina Magnaye, Dean of UP School of Urban and Regional Planning. Professor Dean Christopher Berse, Dean of the UP National College of Public Administration and Governance. And finally, Attorney Abraham Ray Acosta, UP Vice President for Legal Affairs. <laughs> he is the UP President's representative to the committee. Before we proceed with the presentations of our nominees and to give us the report on the current stage of the College of Law, we would like to call on the current Dean in the Chancellor of Youth with Diliman, Attorney Edgardo Carlo Vistan II. Maraming salamat po, Dean Wadi, to the members of the search committee, my fellow deans, VP Abe uh, Costa, members of the faculty of the College of Law, staff, uh, students present here in the theater um, and in, uh, in Zoom or in uh, watching our live streaming of this public forum. Good afternoon to all. I prepared my report knowing that for this event, which is the public forum of the search for the next UP College of Law Dean, the sites uh, of most of our audience, you know, are focused on the future more than anything else. In other words, I believe we are more eager to, her to hear from our two nominees for the law dean, which is why I prepared only a brief report that will highlight what we have done during the past two years and nine months since I assumed the deanship of the college in February of 2021. I also choose the simple route, no, pre no presentations, as I would like to be more reflective in my musings about the status of our college. And with the permission of the next dean, I, I do hope to publish a more or more detailed annual reports for our work since 2021 with the hope that this would start a practice of publishing regular institutional reports here in the UP Law Complex. Yan po yung mga nabitin na plano, hindi na po magagawa under my watch. But uh, if I may describe the state of the UP College of Law in a few words, I would say that we are now bigger with a more diverse offering of learning opportunities that maintain the high quality of our learning outcomes and we have been actively engaged with stakeholders along various fronts. We are a bigger college now as we consistently increased our intake of first-year students during my term. In addition to adding our UP Visayas Iloilo extension classes, we have increased our intake for both Diliman and BGC. We did this for a simple reason. We want to produce more competent, or more competent law graduates as the country needs more able law practitioners. Let me run through a few numbers. For academic year 2020 to 2021, our first year intake was at 252, while our total enrolled Juris Doctor or JD student population was at 1,063. I came in as Dean in February 2021 and for then and for the then forthcoming academic year 2021 to 2022, our first year intake was at 300, which was 48 more than last year's admission, or the last, the last year's admission. This was the year we admitted our first batch of about 20 Iloilo students. So our intake for Diliman and BGC also increased, actually. Our total enrolled JD student population for that year was 1,144. For academic year 2022 to 2023, we took in more first years again, this time a total of 323, and our total enrolled JD students tallied 1,236 for that year. 
for AY for academic year 2023 to 2024, the current academic year, we took in our largest batch of first year students to date. We had 420 for, from 323 last year, no? 420 first year enrollees last September. Our total enrolled JD student population for the current academic year is 1,310. Our college's LLM program also grew because of increases in the number of LLM students that we admitted during the same period, but these were relatively small in comparison with our JD numbers. Our number of graduates for 2021, 2022, and 2023 are as follows, 219, 217, and 260. While these do not yet reflect the impact of our increased intake of first years during my term, we can see the effects already of the policy of increasing our student intake that was initiated by my predecessor, Dean Fides or Dean Deng Cordero Tan. With, these, with the increase in students, we also increased our faculty by adding more lecturers. To support all of this, we, ha we also hired more staff. We upgraded and continue to upgrade our facilities such as our library and classrooms for our bigger community. To support more students whose financial situation made it difficult to take on and continue law studies, we strengthened our scholarship program by backing up our privately funded scholarships with our own UP Law Center scholarship funds. I will no longer dwell on the details for this because the only point I want to convey really for this afternoon's uh, status report is that because of all these reasons, we are now a bigger college, a bigger community. And this positions us to produce more UP lawyers that will serve the country and the Filipino people in the near future. Many of us are familiar with the remark quality, not quantity. In the case of the Philippine legal profession, however, we need more good lawyers to serve the increasing Filipino population and our expanding economy. In other words, we need both quality and quantity, and I believe that we are do what we are doing here in the UP College of Law can help achieve both needs of the legal profession. The numbers I presented earlier dealt with the quantity part of the discussion. Now I move on to the quality part. I came into the deanship aware of the policy debate or question in UP law and in legal academia in general that is framed as follows. Do we train students for law practice or do we teach to make sure that they pass the bar exams? This is a much contested issue that even affected our course offerings in, the, in this law school. When I was studying, that's, that was in, from 1998 to 2003, in addition to the bar review electives, we had a number of other elective courses to choose from covering topics not related to preparing for the bar exams. To seemingly improve bar exam performance, these other electives were no longer offered at a certain point after I graduated, so that several batches of students only had the bar review subjects to choose from. When I became dean, this was still the situation. However, I had a different take on the debate on whether we should be bar-oriented or not. With the advances in technology and teaching methods, and with the resources at UP Law's disposal, I thought that there should no longer be a debate on this point. I believe that, I believe that uh, with our big, bigger, more diverse faculty and powerful teaching tools, we could actually do both. In the same way that our current realities do not really allow us to choose between quantity and quality in the legal profession, I believe that we could and we must prepare our students for practice and give them more learn learning opportunities in non-bar related fields of law, but at the same time prepare them to pass and even excel in the bar examinations. We must still focus on foundational legal knowledge that would help in the bar exams, but I strongly believe that one does not have to fully devote four or five years in law school for a set of exams that span three to four days. 
So in the first semester of academic year 2021 and 2022, and after I became dean a few months before, our more, uh, our more senior students had eight new electives to choose from that were not bar review subjects. These uh, non-bar review elective offerings increased in succeeding semesters such that as of this time, the non-bar elective choices now uh, outnumber slightly that the electives that have a direct impact on bar exam preparations. We wanted our students to have more options for electives that would expose them to fields of law and practice that the bar examinations do not cover. Consistent with the policy of affording our students more choices in learning opportunities, we also improved our clinical legal education program by adding more practicum options for our fourth year law students so that they can be exposed to different practice settings before they take the bar exams. When my term started, we already had a much improved clinical legal education program that featured not only the flag flagship Office of Legal Aid, but five other clinics and extern externship options. To this, we added three more externship options and collaborations that increased the reach and diversified the available practice opportunities in our existing law clinics with one or two more in the pipeline. Did bar exam performance suffer? Perhaps it's too early to tell, but the results of the bar exams during my term answer this question in the negative. In fact, we have seen exceptional outcomes from our bar examinees in recent years. For the 2020 to 2021 bar examinations that were delayed by the pandemic, our overall passing rate was at 98.15% when the national average was at 72.28%. Four of our graduates were ranked among the 14 excellent passers or those with a score of or average score of 90% and above, while 147 of our uh, graduates ranked among the 761 exemplary passers or those with uh, average scores of 85% uh, to 90%. For the 2022 bar examinations, our overall passing rate was 94.27% when the national average was 43.4%. So this was the more difficult bar exam uh, last year. No? This was also the bar examinations wherein the su Supreme Court released a, list of, or released a list of the top 30 bar exam passers 11 of which were UP Law graduates, with the first or top five all coming from UP Law. I know for a fact that at least one of these top notchers took one of the non-review electives, no, uh, an elective on conflict resolution and transitional justice that I taught. Did we do anything different in terms of preparation for these bar exams? Actually, yes. Coming from the pandemic lockdowns, we adopted bridging programs wherein first, we surveyed our students for subject areas or topics they felt they required more instruction on. And second, we disseminated this information to concerned professors of core courses and review electives so that they could address these gaps. Based on student feedback, I believe these, these bridging programs gave our students the knowledge needed to take on the bar exams with more confidence. This approach that was really meant to address the issues brought about by the pandemic and considering our bar performance in the bar exams conducted last year, appears to be a good template for future improvements in how we prepare our students for the bar exams. So in summary, again, for the questions quality or quantity, Bar exam or practice preparation, we, or at least in my, during my ad administration, I decided to avoid making a choice and tried striving for all of these goals. And we have so far seen positive outcomes. So far, I have dwelled on how we are becoming a bigger college with a more diverse offering of learning opportunities while maintaining the high quality of our learning outcomes or outputs. Now I will briefly dwell on how we have, at the same time, been actively engaged with stakeholders along various fronts through our training, research, and extension work in the UP Law Center. 
During the pandemic lockdowns and before my term as dean, the UP Law Center continued to thrive by, adapt, by adapting to the situation and leveraging digital technology to deliver services remotely. When things returned to normal, we continued employing these technologies to supplement in-person or the return of in-person events or activities. And the result has been a very active and engaged UP Law Center. Propelled by the dynamism of our various institutes and their directors and staff no? and our faculty, we were able to stage two major international conferences and many other conferences, training programs, lectures, symposia, fora, and consultations. Working with the Legal Education Board, we implemented the Legal Education Advancement Program last year, wherein we saw other law schools and their faculty, students, and staff participating in the program's various component projects. We also helped the Supreme Court del deliver the bar examinations I mentioned earlier by serving as a local testing center and at one time a command center for the regular bar exams, the bar exams that you will take, as well as the Sharia bar exams. After I became chancellor, the law center also provided much needed legal services to augment, to augment those provided by the UP Diliman Legal Office to the various academic and service units of the university. Alongside all these were the assistance and advising we provided to various institutions, such as the Senate, the House of Representatives, the Supreme Court, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the Department of Social Wel Welfare and Development, to name a few. We also supported our students, staff, and faculty in various ways. In addition to the scholarships for our students that I mentioned earlier, we also supported our students in mooting and debating competitions, in local and foreign conferences and training programs, and in their other extracurricular activities that promote their overall wellness. For our staff, in addition to training and team building activities, we also supported our cooperative by providing additional capitalization through the help of our faculty foundation. The faculty was not left behind. We actually left everyone else behind when last year, we visited the Universidad de Malaga for an academic conference a little more than a year ago. There were, of course, several other individuals who contributed to all that we here in the UP College of Law have been able to do in the less than three years since February 2021 when I became dean. I cannot possibly name all of you because that's how active and dynamic everyone here is. But I must acknowledge for their hard work and immense contributions, their guidance, and their constant support of my deanship the following. Associate Dean Solomon F. Lumba, our College Secretary Michelle Mamchi San Buenaventura D, former UP President and former Dean of the College Danilo L. Concepcion, former Dean Deng Cordero Tan, the frontliners of our Clinical Legal Education Program and the Office of Legal Aid, Professor Teddy Te and Attorney, Mar and Attorney Marwil N. Liasos. I also thank Attorney Celeste Sembrano Maliari for, and Beng Lilang for uh, ably overseeing the administrative affairs of the Law Center at different points during my term. And of course, I, ha I must, and really, uh, from uh, heart, uh, uh, sincerely thank the staff of the Office of the Dean and the Office of Legal Aid for all your help and support and for making these offices largely operate on autopilot at crucial stages of my concurrent deanship and directorship of these two offices and when I eventually became chancellor. I always tell my students there's no other way to dream but to, but to dream big. And I was planning on doing more as dean of the College of Law. But as you all know, I decided to answer another challenge that was offered to me, that of the chancellorship of UP Diliman, and as the fates will have it, my life is now headed in another direction. I am now in the process of transitioning from the deanship of our law school, which is why I, as chancellor, I had already initiated the search for the next dean of the College of Law. The search process could very well end on November 30, and I will be requesting the Board of Regents to allow me 
At the very moment, a new dean is elected to step down and not finish my term as dean, which ends on February 25, 2024, to enable the new dean to assume office immediately. I do not want the new dean to lose, to lose ground uh, the remaining month of the year since we are entering a new uh, calendar year. I believe the new dean should have that whole calendar year and, and the remainder of this year to plan and to uh, initiate those plans early next year. After that, no, I would still be dreaming big for the College of Law, but now only as Chancellor of UP Diliman. That may all be for the best, for what, with a bigger hat, I can dream bigger for our college and the rest of UP Diliman. And with me, dreaming for the college would be one of our two nominees, both of whom, both of whom we will be hearing from in a short while, and both of whom I know are more than capable of great aspirations and great outcomes. Muli maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay ang UPLO. Isang mapagpala at mapagpalayang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, we're holding this public forum to provide a platform for all our stakeholders to, to get to know our nominees and listen to the visions and plans of our uh, two nominees. And so we will be giving each one of them uh, 20 to 30 minutes to present uh, her vision and plan after which we'll open the floor for uh, question and answer. No? So, uh, yeah, I think to get us rolling, our first nominee to present her plan would be Attorney Darlene Marie B. Berberabe. And she's currently a senior, uh, senior lecturer at the UP College of Law. But before teaching here, she served as an assistant professor at the philosophy department of the UP College of Social Sciences and Philosophy from 1988 to 1999. She is also the first, uh, she's the first female philosophy faculty member in the said department and was recently recognized as a distinguished alumna of CSSP. Among her current assigned engagements, uh, attorney Berberabi was appointed by the Supreme Court as a member of the Department of Jurisprudence and Legal Philosophy, uh, Philippine Judicial Academy from 2021 up to the present. She also served as a bar examiner for 2020-2021 bar. Uh, she is also a faculty member and senior fellow at the Philippine Public Safety College. Attorney Berberabe is a lawyer and academician with skills and experience in the public, private, and academic sectors. She has over 20 years of experience in attorney CEO roles in the government and private sectors, and as an educator in various academic institutions. Professor Berberabe finished her undergraduate and postgraduate education at UP. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from UPCSSP in 1989, where she graduated as a summa cum laude. And in 1994, she finished her Master of Arts in Philosophy, followed by her Bachelor of Law degree from UP College of Law in 1999. Currently, she's taking up her PhD in Philosophy. So again, ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Berberabia. Good afternoon to the honorable members of the search committee, uh, Dean Julkipli Wadi, uh, Dean Christopher Burse, Dean Dina Magnai, um, VP for Legal Affairs, uh, Attorney Abraham Acosta, Chancellor uh, Carlo Vistan. Uh, magsalamin muna tayo at uh, 
wala akong makita dito. So, thank you so much for this opportunity to present uh, my vision and plans as one of your two nominees for the UP Law Dean. Uh, maraming mga ibang nagsasabi na parang wala yatang lalaking uh, tumakbo. Uh, so, siguro Prof. Gwen, uh, baka natakot na sa ating dalawa. Um, okay. So, I submitted my uh, vision and plans and which I hope that uh, you are able to access and read. And I prepared a summary uh, of um, my ideas. If I will be fortunate enough to have your support and um, the choice of our Board of Regents. So, this is my vision for you, Pilo. Okay. Can we go to the next slide, please? So my vision for UP Law is to be the leader in legal education in the country and Asia. So sinaklaw ko na po yung mas malawak. So not only ASEAN but Asia by providing superior opportunities to study law and in an environment that encourages discourse, collaboration with relevant stakeholders, in an environment that encourages critical thinking under rigorous pedagogy, responsive to the technological and social change, and always mindful of public service and towards, of public service and UP's commitment towards a just society. And all of these, in, in all of these, we have a, a long tradition of producing graduates in the executive legislative and judicial departments and not only is my vision for us to continue doing that tradition but I am hoping that all the graduates that we produce do public service with honor and excellence. Yun pong, with honor and excellence I think is very important because it is, it is not just landing in important roles in society but in always be mindful of our purpose and the values of UP, which are honor and excellence. So my, my vision can be encapsulated into two, which is academic, uh, to be the leader in academic, uh, in, to be the leader in academic instruction with the values of academic freedom and excellence and public service with honor and excellence. Next slide, please. So under academic freedom and excellence, one, um, one important mandate of the UP Law Complex is instruction. So one of my flagship programs is of course to support, to continue to support the method of instruction which is Socratic method, uh, case method with a Socratic um, method of instruction plus clinical method which is now augmented with a clinical legal education program. Number two, we continue to recruit and develop faculty members who are experts in their chosen fields or who continue to distinguish themselves in their chosen fields. And especially because there are areas which are rapidly evolving, we have to also develop experts or recruit uh, those alumni which are um, studying or distinguishing themselves in this area such as artificial intelligence and IP, privacy and cybersecurity, energy law, competition to name a few. Next, to hold to continuously hold special projects and workshops for the emergent areas such as bioethics and law, law and economics, jurisprudence and legal theory, ESG and the law. And the last item under instruction would be to promote the exchange of our faculty, invite visiting foreign lecturers and resource persons both for our JD and LLM programs. Another mandate for our UP Law Complex is research. And one of the programs that I wish to support is to have a safe, inspiring, and supportive environment for discourse, 
such as holding research cafes or dialogues. Environment for discourse for me is very important. What does that mean? We start to talk about issues which sometimes we are afraid to talk about or to discuss. Now in, the, in, in this time where there is social media, what do we, how do we react when we hear about different opinions? So usually we don't want to listen to them. But for me, I believe in the promotion of the marketplace of ideas, that we have to hear different ideas so that we can pluck out which is the best idea. Next is to promote research groups or communities. So for example, we must also make strategic decisions. For example, do we want to be experts in constitutional law and drive the research groups towards that area? Do we want to be experts in good govern governance? So we also have to do specific steps towards promoting research in that area. Next would be mentoring for colleagues so that experts in certain fields will already mentor their colleagues in the, in, the, in the faculty, the junior members, as well as the students in order to specifically target certain areas where we want to be experts in. And of course, very import, the very important funding support for the research that we are strategically choosing to undertake. Now, I would like also to share my plans for faculty and staff. So I've had the privilege of uh, sharing some time with our non-academic staff. And as part of uh, the vision and plan that I um, included in my, in my paper, I said that we should focus on resource su support. And a specific program on this is to push for the position and compensation classification review. One feedback is that we are not, or there is area for improvement in the staffing, in the salary grade um, classification, in the items or the, uh, the number of plantilla items. So I understand that there has been a study initiated by Dean Deng Cordero Tan, and I hope to push for the continued study and to undertake specific steps towards the review and hopefully the implementation of such program. Next is the presence and exposure of faculty in international conferences, exchange programs, secondment, and scholarships, and trainings should be given to our staff as well as faculty when they occupy positions of, uh, when they occupy administrative positions or positions of management. Next slide, please. For the student welfare, I propose to support our wellness uh, committee by creating a well-being working group which will be promoting the well-being and the health uh, issues where, there, where that will be a forum for sh the sharing of needs and accessing resources. The, the next item is for, to provide academic coaching, student career planning, and career advising to give them a, an overview of how it, how it is to work in the real world, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the non-government uh, organizations as well. And the last is engagement between student and alumni for mentoring and networking. So we hope to really engage our alumni in order to be more active in the activities to support as well our students. So networking is very important and for those who are in leadership roles in private sector or public sector to provide opportunities for our students will be very, very critical. The next will be programs for alumni. I hope to push for professional and lifelong learning activities by way of online courses. During the pandemic, we've had the um, exposure to online courses which have made um, many students undertake 
further studies. And with that, now that we are going back to normal, we could still adopt certain programs that will maximize or promote um, courses online so that our alumni who are based abroad could, um, could access such programs. So I was thinking of programs like the partnership between Harvard and, and edX where these courses could be made available to alumni who want to, div to deep dive into certain fields um, of legal study or related disciplines. Next is active engagement of alumni. So we have our alumni relations uh, office. I've had the honor of um, serving as a board member of the UP Law Alumni Foundation. And uh, we are always in discussion on how to, how to strengthen our re alumni relations office so that we could access the, the many resources of our alumni. They are very eager to be organized. So even if they are abroad, I hope that we could establish our very active relationship so that they could also support our ongoing programs here on ground. So we hope to see the creation of alumni chapters. We hope to support the local organizations that are already created their events, conferences, so that we will be more present, and special interest groups. Next slide, please. The second part of my vision pertains to public service with honor and excellence. And the other mandate for the UP Law Complex is legal extension service. So I hope to strengthen the collaboration with legislature, executive, and judiciary. Chancellor Carlo has already enumerated the many programs that we have established, and I hope to push and support and augment those programs. So I've had information that the Congress would want a memorandum of agreement with our college so that we can support the Congress in the drafting of their laws and they want the relationship to be not ad hoc, but institutionalized. And my vision is also for UP law, not only to be for UP law, but a UP law for the UP community and a UP law for the nation. By being more relevant and present, not only for our internal activities, but also for the external activities that will affect nation building. Next is to provide public interest opportunities by way of internships or externships. So Chancellor Carlo has mentioned our partnerships with several government agencies and I hope to add on to those uh, partner government agencies which can provide the opportunities for experiential learning for our students and also classroom uh, with a classroom component via the internships. We also have an existing program on pop law, which is popularizing law for functional leg legal literacy to the people. And I hope to make this more active and to support this because we have to be more relevant. We are, we are an academy for instruction and we hope to be also the teachers of the Filipino people translate our legalese to understandable language for the rest of our citizenry. And lastly, under public service with honor and excellence, is, the, is building a culture of integrity. I hope to promote discussions or workshops on ethics for good decision making for situations of conflict of interest and to build a culture of transparency, integrity, and professionalism in the college. Uh, alam ko po na lahat ng mga graduate ng UP Law ay mahuhusay. Um, subalit, siguro matatesting ang ating pagiging UP graduate paglabas natin ng tunay na buhay. 
at uh, gusto ko pong ibahagi sa inyo na maraming pagkakataon na nasubukan ang values na itinuro sa atin ng UP sa aking buhay. At siguro po, uh, makakatingin ako sa bawat uh, isa sa inyo na masasabi ko na hindi ko ipinahiya ang UP nung ako ay um, nabigyan ng pagkakataon na makapaglingkod sa government by way of my appointment in the Pag-ibig Fund uh, during the time of uh, President Aquino. Now, I was also, or the, the nominees were also asked to provide a smooth transition plan. So, um, next slide, please. So, I hope that there will be onboarding sessions. Of course, the incumbent leaders will share their accomplishment report so that the new dean um, will be able to see what are the programs that should be continued or stopped, or if there are new programs that should be started, which programs to be refined or strengthened. Next is there should be clear communication and transparent plan on transition for changes, if any. Okay? Lagi pong masakit ang mga pagbabago, subalit, uh, kung mayroong malinaw na plano at um, pagsasaad at paglalahad at pakikipag-usap sa mga taong kinauukulan, naiibsan ang uh, uh, sakit na nararamdaman ng isang organisasyon. And last, the timings of the changes should be reasonable and well-planned to avoid disruption. Uh, Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. So, what can I offer to you, Pilo? Um, thank you po, kay uh, Dean Berse, for sharing um, some of my credentials. And I present myself to you for, the, for your consideration of support. Um, what can I offer to you, Pilo? I, I can offer the values of open-mindedness, openness to discourse and professionalism. In the recent past, we have had experience of leaders who have suffered through hubris. Once they reach a position of power, they only want to hear good news. They don't want to hear divergent ideas. Sa akin po, yun ang pinakamahirap. Uh, for all of us to group think, and to think that a, a different feedback will be damaging to the leadership, I think that is most dangerous. I offer to you my ability to listen, to determine which are urgent and how to address the issues. I offer to you my experience from the external environment and my familiarity with government relations. I have strong administrator experience on how to make things happen with integrity and excellence. So my first part of my career was in the academe. I have a strong background in philosophy and that's why in my PhD in philosophy, I'm trying to combine two fields which are close to my heart, which are philosophy and law. So I've do I have done my uh, coursework in a PhD, and if I will be elected as dean, then that will be that will take a pause uh, for now. So academe um, in philosophy, and then a few years after my graduation, I was invited by uh, Dean Raul Pangalangan to be part of uh, the UP faculty. Um, and I taught uh, legal theory, legal method, uh, labor relations, and labor standards. So during the time that I was in the private sector, I always found time to be a lecturer uh, in the UP law. In the private sector, so I, uh, ha I also have um, law firm experience with Kisumbing Torres, and my practice was labor law and a very short time in international law. And I became uh, the chief legal counsel for Procter & Gamble. 
And then in 2010, when I was about to be sent to Singapore as an expat uh, in PNG, um, I was appointed by the President of the Republic of the Philippines to head Pag-ibig Fund. Uh, I still remember what Vice President Binay um, uh, told me when he, he was inviting me or when he was asking me to present, to allow him to submit my CV to the search committee uh, of the uh, President Pinoy's uh, government then. Uh, he said, uh, wag ka assuming, Attorney Berberabe, baka naman di ka ma-appoint, so gusto ko lang ibigay yung CV mo. Sabi ko, uh, sige sir, pero wala po akong alam sa housing finance. Kasi I was the lawyer for Procter and Gamble, okay? So for, um, I, I think, six years. So sabi sa akin ni VP Bina, who was the chairman of Pag-ibig Fund, wag ka mag-alala ako din. Okay, uh, medyo parang... Uh, tatagilid ang ating uh, major housing program. Okay. And um, may bonus pa po, parang a week after my appointment, um, Pag-ibig Fund was involved in a Senate investigation okay, for corruption. So, uh, ganito po kataas yung mga dokumento na babasahin. Uh, inamoy ko na lang po dahil naniniwala ako sa principle of osmosis. So, <laughs> After po nung Senate investigation na yon, uh, we had to implement reforms. So in the first year and second year, so many stakeholders uh, got mad at Pag-ibig Fund because there were a lot of reforms. But after those two painful years of reform implementation, since then, we always got unqualified opinion from the Commission on Audit, which is very, very important for your finance, for the government financial institutions. That's the highest, uh, that's the highest evaluation that the COA could give. We, we had 38 branches before. After my tenure, Pag-ibig Fund has 118 branches. So there was a lot of reorganization. We doubled the benefits of Pag-ibig Fund without increasing the monthly contribution. So why am I saying this to you? So, dahil armed lamang po ako dun sa values na sinasabi ko sa inyo ng uh, openness, professionalism, um, values of honor and excellence, and kahit napunta sa isang uh, posisyon na uh, wala akong familiarity, Pagkatapos po ng tenure na yon, uh, parang maiipagmalaki naman po ko na isang graduate ng, ng UP Law ay uh, nakapagpatupad uh, ng mga programa na hanggang ngayon ay ipinagpapatuloy ng, uh, ng uh, ahensya na yon. So that is my exposure in, ad, uh, in an administrative position. So that is what I can offer my experience in the academe, my experience in the private sector, and my experience in the public sector. So my name is Darlene Marie Basco Berberabe. I am also a mother. Uh, yan po naman ang abag ko sa lipunan that I was able to nurture um, a, a young lady who graduated also summa cum laude in BS Mathematics. Mas mataas po ang average niya kaysa sa akin. Uh, and uh, a two-time gold medalist in karate uh, for in our SEA Games. So, yan po ang ambag ko naman bilang, uh, bilang ina and which, which I am very proud of to share always as part of my credentials. So, I'm Professor Berberabe and I'm willing and ready to serve as your UP Law Dean. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Berberabe, for sharing with us your credentials and your vision and plans for the college. Uh, our next nominee is Attorney Gwen Grecia de Vera. 
Prof. Gwen Devera is currently an associate professor here at the UP College of Law. And since 2019, she has also been serving as an assistant to the dean in relation to student affairs. She was recently designated as director of the U UP Law Center Institute for the Administration of Justice. He is likewise the program director of the Competition Law and P Policy Program, or CLPP, of the UP Law Center. Prof. Devera is part of the uh, Clinical Legal Education Program team of the College of Law, where she supervises the public externships with the Philippine Competition Commission and Energy Regulatory Commission. She also previously served as assistant professor where she start, started as a senior lecturer in 1997 and later served as director of the UPLC Institute of International Legal Studies from 2008 to 2011. She joined the Philippine Competition Commission in 2017 as its first executive director. And prior to the passage of the Philippine Competition Act, she worked, as, she worked on antitrust and competition issues in various sectors, including pharmaceuticals and energy. She has experience in advisory uh, and litigation work in both the private and the public sectors. And before joining the PCC, she also served as the Dean of the Manuel Alquezon University School of Law. Prof. Devera reserved, uh, received her Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of the Philippines in 1995 and was admitted to the Philippine Bar in 1996, having obtained the seventh highest ranking in the bar examinations for that year. She obtained her Master of Laws degree from Northwestern University School of Law in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor De Vera. To the members of the search committee, led by Dean Julki Pliwadi, Dean Christopher Berse, Dean Dina Magnaye, our Chancellor and Dean Carlo Vistan, our University Vice President for Legal, Abe Acosta, our UP Law Complex officials, regular and part-time faculty members, non-teaching staff, students, alumni, stakeholders joining us in person and virtually, friends, family, and fellow nominee, Attorney Lelen Bedberabe, a pleasant good afternoon. I am Associate Professor Gwen Grecia de Vera, member of the class of 1995, happy spouse to fellow lawyer, Attorney Arnold de Vera, and proud mother of four. I am humbled and honored in equal measure to present myself to you and declare my readiness to serve as your next dean. As many of you know, I have been a member of this community for the last 26 years as teacher, scholar, and academic administrator. And if we can include the time I spent here as a student, that's 32 years. So, wag yun na pong imat yung aking edad, no? So, double digits na po yun, so wag na nating i-add. I am proud to share with you what I hope will be our vision mission and our program for action for the University of the Philippines Law Complex. I am confident that in the next three years, we will together be able to put to good use these three years in the realization of our vision of a UP Law Complex. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. A UP Law Complex where leadership inspires, truth and justice prevail, public service embodies the highest aspirations of our people. Next slide, please. Our vision is based on the unique role of the University of the Philippines Law Complex within the national university and our country. To fulfill our mandate as an integrated national legal institution 
dedicated to teaching and research, training and extension services uh, in a way that is relevant to the demand of our people for justice and democratization. We must institutionalize inspiring and ethical leadership and promote the values of fairness and justice. Our mission is anchored on the governance mechanisms and guiding principles of administrative order number eight and the consciousness of building on our best traditions. Next slide, please. These are the linchpins, linchpins of our plan of action, the key areas of which are the following. Transparency and good governance, faculty development, curriculum development, reps and administrative development, student welfare and development, community engagement and internationalization, financial matters, alumni relations, and extension activities. So allow me to permit, or permit me, to please discuss each one with you very briefly. First and foremost, transparency and good governance. We will strengthen the governance mechanism under Administrative Order Number 8 by the following. Resuming the collegial governance of the UP Law Complex by the Dean and the faculty. I cannot overstate how vital this is to, to the UP Law Complex and for taking UP Law Complex into the future of legal practice. Collegial governance is based on mutual respect and robust discussion and deliberation on institutional goals and even sensitive issues of paramount importance. We will also resume the monthly meetings of the permanent faculty, activate the executive committee composed of the dean, associate dean, institute directors, and an elected member of the faculty, activate the law consultative council composed of the dean, associate dean, institute directors, a representative from both the full-time and part-time faculty, two rep representatives, a representative from the administrative staff, and the president of the UP Law Alumni Association and the president of our law student government. It is also important that we enhance the transparency and fairness of the college's admissions process, particularly because we wish to grow in the application of academic delinquency rules by strengthening the admissions committee and the appeals committee in accordance with our college rules. Why are these necessary and what makes them achievable? First, because we are one UP Law Complex. We should function under the unified leadership of the dean with professionalism and collegiality as the guiding principles of our decision-making processes. Two, because the strength of any educational institution lies in its faculty. We have, and I'm proud to share this with our students here, we have the distinction among law schools of having a permanent faculty composed of dedicated educators, scholars, and public intellectuals. And third, because the delivery on the UP Law Complex mandate requires collegial governance. The UP Law Complex should be governed by the Dean of the UP College of Law and its faculty as a collegial body. The faculty with the Dean as the presiding officer decides on all matters academic and curricular in the College of Law. And there should be a complete integration of the law faculty, research and academic staff of the College and Law Center because we are one UP Law Complex and we are a national legal institution. Next slide, please. Faculty development. We will fulfill our commitment to strengthening and augmenting our faculty by rationalizing the ranks of the part-time faculty, consulting the college's academic clusters in the selection of the new faculty. So I'd mentioned earlier, we are going to build on our best traditions. We have to balance continuity and change. So one of the innovations that had been incorporated, in which I thought proved very helpful during the pandemic, was the creation of eight academic clusters. So we will also institutionalize the orientation of the regular faculty on the processes for promotions, requirements for tenure, professorial chair opportunities, 
research awards, resident scholarships, study leave with pay, administrative load credit, study load credit, extension load credit, sabbatical, retirement extension, and Professor Emeritus, among others. Institutionalizing the leadership and management training of the permanent faculty by, among others, rotating or exposing them to the key administrative offices of the college, such as the Office of the Associate Dean, Office of the College Secretary, the institutes and academic programs. Sending members of the faculty to take up their doctorate at the University of Malaga Law School to leverage on our continuing relationship with the University of Malaga following our involvement in Calesa and to short-term training opportunities here and abroad. It is also very important to coordinate with UP to request the relevant government offices for additional permanent faculty items. As our Chancellor and Dean reported earlier, we now have over a thousand students across three locations, Diliman, BGC, and Iloilo. Yet, we have only over 20 permanent items. For example, at the College of Social Work and Community Development, I understand they currently have 600 students with 38 permanent faculty and a roster of five or more Professor Emeriti. Implementing the faculty development opportunities under the Capacity Building to Foster Competition project in, in collaboration with the Philippine Competition Commission under our Memorandum of Agreement with the agency. At the height of the pandemic, we said, no learner left behind. And technology continues to outpace us. And now we say there shouldn't be any learner or teacher left behind. Next slide, please. Curriculum development. All we need to do is examine what our graduates and lawyers do today to see how important curriculum review, development, and reform are. Just a quick check of the practice areas of one of our leading law firms demonstrates the expansion of legal work to cover e-commerce and technology, energy and natural resources, ESG, food and drug, telecommunications and media, among others. A commitment to curriculum development will help us prepare our graduates for the future of law practice. Today's lawyers must also be tomorrow's practitioners. Our curriculum must speak to our undisputed role as the academic leader and premier legal institution in the country. I am proud to acknowledge our faculty's commitment here. Just recently, the commercial law cluster of which I am a part, with the help of our cluster chair, Justice Roger Quevedo, our uh, government chief counsel, and uh, Professor Mike Tew, was able to secure approval for new electives. Previously, I also understand that electives in human rights law were also approved. We have also established an LLM program, but we should not stop there and support advanced studies and research by creating a PhD program under the Capacity Building for Legal and Social Advancement project funded by the European Union. Next slide, please. Our reps and administrative staff have a critical role in fulfilling the mandate of the law complex to contribute to the improvement of the legal system and the quality of the administration of justice and enhancing and in enhancing the knowledge of the law on the part of the citizenry. Our guiding principle tells us that one, the research and extension functions of the UP Law Center should be structured around an organizing focus and purpose so as to mobilize our professional and administrative staff. And two, there should be an effective system of recruitment for the reps and administrative staff that is supported by a clear competency guide and adequate remuneration. To this end, we will design and establish an endowment fund over a period of 10 years, the interest of which will be used to support scholarships and development activities for students, reps, and the administrative staff. Strengthen the governance, the self-governance of the assembly of administrative officers through substantial input in the day-to-day -day operations and policy directions of the law complex. 
coordinate with the University of the Philippines to request the relevant government offices for permanent non-academic items to address, among others, the lack of a career track within the various offices of the UP Law Complex. Establish a career path for non-permanent personnel and strengthen the employees' cooperative through trainings in self-governance, transparency, and the installation of real point-of-sale system and analytics system accessible to all members. I dadagdag ko lang po rito na one of our alumnos, I saw him earlier, uh, tinanong niya, sabi niya, naku, hindi pa ako nagla-lunch. Uh, saan kaya ako pwede mag-lunch dito? So, proud naman po ako kasi sabi ko, ba, madami na palang variety apart from walking across the street to Via Mare. So, unang-una ko pong tinuro sa kanya, tama ba, ay yung co-op. So, meron po tayong co-op dito at uh, masarap po ang kanilang uh, mga hinahain. Ang hindi ko pala nabanggit kanina at uh, nalaman ko lang din po ito ng investiture ni Chancellor Vistan, uh, masarap din po pala ang shomai. Dito naman po yan sa may, uh, sa may labas kasi yun daw po ang favorite ni Chancellor. <laughs> O masarap daw po yung toyo. So dagdag nyo na po yung katabi po yata ng siomay, masarap din daw ang uh, carbonara o pansit. Yan. <laughs> Ayan, meron pong, meron pong ano. Uh, bukod po doon, uh, at uh, hindi po nabanggit ni Chancellor Vistan kanina, pero uh, nagawan po niya ng paraan na maging affordable po para sa lahat. Uh, lalo na po sa mga isudyante, yung ating meals. So, meron din po tayo uh, sa first floor na concessionaire. Yan, meron pa ng, may kulang pa ba? Na ma ah, meron din po pala tayong Cafe de Lipa dito sa Learning Commons. So, we must also institutionalize policies and activities that relate to diversity and inclusion. Next slide, please. Student wellness and development. I take it to heart that it is our obligation to our students as one UP Law Complex to offer legal education and training that assures mastery of law, development of skills for law practice, which are formed by a sense of purpose as Filipino lawyers. Therefore, for the study and teaching of law must be integrated with other disciplines and professions so that law itself can be viewed as part of a social process and a study of sound decision making. To this end, part of our plan is also to create an endowment fund, um, the interest of which will be used to support scholarships and development activities for students, reps, and administrative staff fully fund the expenses of our international of our participation in international moot court uh, competitions provide financial logistical and administrative support to traditional student driven and student led initiatives such as the philippine law journal bar operations career fair and sports fests i would also like to invite the faculty please support these activities, particularly the Philippine Law Journal. Continue and enhance programs for physical fitness and mental wellness. No, bago po nagka-pandemic, nagkaroon pa tayo ng sports fest. No? Uh, and continue and enhance, kaya lang po hindi ako nakasali dun sa ano. Uh, hinihintay ko sanang ayain nila akong sumali dun sa yung... Uh, Ano bang tawag doon? Yung parang dance-dance. Yan, yeah, nagkaroon sila ng dance-dance competition. Uh, and continue enhance programs for um, diversity and inclusion. Next slide, please. We would also like to enhance our wider community engagement and internationalization. We will try, we will strive to strengthen our involvement in the UP Diliman community and the larger UP system. Our UP Law Center must be made accessible and responsive through innovative use of technology. Okay. Um, and we must enhance those services that our community have come to rely on. 
and again create PhD programs under the aegis of capacity building for legal and social advancement funded by the European Union. It is gratifying uh, being part of the UPLOC complex and having been able uh, to take uh, academic administrative roles to see how interested other colleges and schools just within Diliman are interested in collaborating with us. So we should explore that in the next three years and onwards. In financial matters, next slide please. Our guiding principle is the Legal Research Fund should be used more intensively, effectively, and judicially. We will build on efforts to make legal education accessible and to be the leading institution in this regard. So as I would mentioned earlier, apart from the establishment of the endowment fund, we should also implement an online payment system for UP Law Complex transactions. I'd like to add here, as Chancellor mentioned earlier, the support that we are providing our students through both privately funded and internally funded scholarships. And I laud our administrative leaders for taking that initiative. Only recently, I learned that at Yale University School of Law, this is an important area in which they are trying to lead. So one of the innovations that we did in our scholarship program was to heighten or emphasize giving of scholarship on the basis of need rather than on merit. Yale Law School took that a step further, and I think just last year, they welcomed the first 50 students that were underprivileged and whose recruitment they sought out specifically. So it's not just a matter of making it affordable or saying that there is financial assistance available, okay? but making the admissions process responsive so that we can seek out talented but underprivileged future lawyers. Next slide, please. Alumni relations. Our alumni have and will continue to play a crucial role in supporting the UP Law Complex. For this purpose, we will continue to strengthen our relationship with UPLAF and UPLAA. And the other alumni batches and institutionalize the Alumni Relations Office by providing administrative, logistical, and financial support to the initiatives of the Alumni Relations Office to launch a website and online payment facility and improve the functionality of the alumni database, among others. In addition, just recently, our UP president and alumnus, let's see, President Angelo Jimenez, of course, some of us call him here, Jijil. Our UP president is a proud alumnus, and recently he launched a mentorship program after which we can model our own here at the law complex. In fact, shortly before the pandemic, one of our alumni, uh, one of our alumna, I believe, from Harvard, already submitted a proposal for launching a mentorship program between our alumni and our students. So our alumni can play a valuable role in supporting students, not only financially, but through mentoring, knowledge and experience sharing, and providing networking opportunities. Next slide, please. With respect to extension activities, we would like to expand the participation of our institutes. We have five. At the earliest stage of proposed laws, rules, and regulations, instead of at the notice and comment stage. In addition, we would like to enhance the delivery of services to the legal community by the Law Center through the mandatory continuing legal education program, our paralegal training program, and our bar review program. We will continue and expand the current partnerships and projects with government, the Supreme Court, the LEB, the LEB, as Chancellor mentioned earlier, Congress, uh, the Philippine Competition Commission, Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of National Defense, the PNP, BARM, SECERC, among others. And we will compile a database of experts 
I think this is something that was started as a result of our participation in the ISO program. And resource persons for government consultations to develop and promote faculty members and reps. Siguro po, uh, mag, mag, maglalahad lang po ako ng uh, dalawang kwento. No? Kasi kung binilang nyo po yung inad nyo yung 26 at 32 kanina, uh, malalaman nyo naman po kung kailan ako naging young faculty member. So I was young once. Um, and as a young faculty member, I was very excited to be part of this community. So paano po ba ako na uh, bumalik dito? No? So uh, gaya po nung nabanggit kanina sa introduction, and I'm very grateful for that kind introduction, uh, I was part of uh, Batch 1995. I passed the bar in 1996, but I became part of the regular faculty, uh, not the regular faculty, I became part of the faculty in 1997. Okay, so, hindi po matagal uh, bago po ako nag-graduate ng law school. Um, but that was a blessing because um, I worked with an alumnus, Justice Vicente V. Mendoza at the Supreme Court. I was his law clerk. And when I was ready to leave uh, the Supreme Court, uh, one of the first things that I actually did was to take, this is how much I wanted to teach. My first job as a teacher was actually teaching first year English at the Ateneo de Manila. Okay, so I taught um, poetry, literature, and grammar in one year. So when Justice Mendoza learned that I was teaching at the Ateneo, he called me in and he said, I think you should be teaching at the College of Law. Then I told him, but doesn't that happen only by invitation? So he paved the way for me and I will forever be grateful to him. He said, uh, let me write to Dean Merlin Magaliona, who was a dean at the time, but it will be up to Dean Merlin to determine whether you will be invited. Okay, so after Dean Merlin received uh, that note from Justice Mendoza. It took a while, but eventually he called me in and I sat with him. Uh, baka hindi nyo na po naabutan si Dean Merlin Magaliano, no, he passed on. But those who had been his students here, <clears throat> I'm sure you will understand <clears throat> when I say what an experience it was sitting with him for a one-hour interview. Yeah, so isang oras po niya akong in-interview for a position as lecturer. Okay. Um, and it took maybe two weeks before he called me back in to say, I'm offering you uh, a position as lecturer here in the College of Law, but you will begin in the next semester so that you have time to prepare for your class. No. So as a young faculty member, uh, that kind of engagement by your dean was so important for me as an introduction to the college. And then later, um, when... Uh, other administrators thought that I should be part of the regular faculty. I was also invited, and it was now Judge Raul Pangalangan who supported uh, my application to be part of the regular faculty. So I experienced all of what I am proposing, sitting in regular faculty meetings. No? So again, sayang, hindi nyo na naabutan si Professor Araceli Baviera. Yan. So yung mga natatawa, kasing edad ko po sila. Yung mga natatawa pa, ha? So, uh, so, napakalaking bagay po nun, no? Kasama ko si Professor Araceli Baviera sa faculty library. Kasama ko po siya sa faculty library. At napaka-inspiring po kasi she must have been maybe over 80, uh, over 70 at that time. And she would have a pile of Supreme Court reports annotated because she was preparing for her class. The following year, she would have the same pile or it would be brought to her room. So meron po dito tayo sa second floor, ang pangalan po ay Professor Baviera Room kasi yun po talaga yung faculty room niya nung araw. No? So yung staff po, dadalan siya ng stack of ASCRA kasi po pala maglalabas siya ng libro. Okay? So even as one of our senior faculty members, she wrote two of her textbooks. Uh, I think it was civil law and, uh, well earlier it was sales and then civil law later. No? So, uh, since nag-down memory lane na rin lang tayo, idadagdag ko na, no? nagkasama kami ni Prof. Baviera nung nag-blackout sa faculty lounge. No? Si, si Prof. Baviera kasi kahit magkasama kami, she will acknowledge that I'm with her uh, preparing for class, but she will not say anything. Pero nag-blackout, nako, 
talagang ano ba yan? Bakit walang generator? So, um, but that interaction with your regular faculty members, and I would like to add, no? Uh, ang isa sigurong pwede nating institutionalize if we're trying to strengthen the faculty member is having faculty members, particularly young or new regular, young lecturers or new regular faculty members to work with more senior ones. So I've also had the benefit of working in teaching teams. No, yung kauna-unahan po nun sa commercial law review. Ang review classes po hindi natin ibinibigay sa mga batang uh, lecturers. No? Um, but one of our lecturers at the time could no longer handle the class in the second semester. So we were invited by the dean to consider, if I recall correctly, I think it was um, um, Dean Raul, to consider if I and uh, a late uh, blockmate, no, si Attorney Dave Puyat, could teach commercial law review, but only in the company of uh, our, our former president, Danilo L. Concepcion. Okay? Uh, and subsequently, we innovated by splitting the commercial law subjects so that students would not have to take five units in one, in one semester. And then subsequently, I had the opportunity to work with my mentor, si, uh, Associate Justice Vicente V. Mendoza, when we taught together the course in judicial review. No? So marami pong benefit. Um, uh, nakita ko po sa abroad, no, sa kanilang law schools, meron silang academy for students who wish to teach. And although we may be the only institution with permanent faculty or one of the few with permanent faculty in the country, now that we have over 100 lecturers, no, uh, I think nung, Ogero, wag, uh, wag na i-compute, pero nung araw, parang lahat ata ng teacher kilala namin at lahat ng teacher maging ti -ti teacher mo. No? But ngayon, we have over 200 lecturers on our roster, but in any one semester, over 160 teach. And I think it would greatly benefit no? uh, that growing number if we also institutionalize preparing lawyers to practice law by teaching. Eh, hindi na po yung totoo yung those who cannot do teach. Because only those who can should teach. No? So maybe an academy for that. Particularly because kung ka ka tayo po ang premier legal institution in the country, then it is our mission to train teachers and to send them out. And if we can start with our students, eh, I think that will prepare them for a great career in law. So before I conclude, hindi pa naman po ato 30 minutes, but before I conclude, um, I wish to extend my profound thanks to this community. To the non-teaching staff with whom I have shared many years in the college, thank you. You have been generous with your precious time in the last few days. Gaya nga po na nagsabi ni Atty. Berberabe. But more importantly, you have always stood steady to help, stood ready to help deliver on our commitments, particularly in providing administrative support for our projects. Thank you. To our students, particularly my current and former students, thank you for welcoming me to the classroom. I have been fortunate in many years here to work with our most talented, diligent, and conscientious. As some of you know, I was invited to consider accepting a nomination to this deanship by students. Their willingness to take part in this important selection process and to remain engaged by their presence here has left me inspired, so thank you. To my fellow faculty members, especially the regular faculty, fellow teachers and educators, despite your teaching and research work, you made time for our conversations in the last few weeks, and they have greatly informed my experience and these plans. To our alumni from private and public sectors, whether in law practice or other fields, you continually challenge how we teach and learn. I'm especially grateful to my mentor, former Associate Justice Vicente Mendoza, who, uh, who was ready to impart his wit and wisdom and what he calls logic and rhetoric as soon as he learned that I had accepted the nomination. To our current and immediate past academic administrations, administrators, sorry, Prof. Chi 
Associate Dean Sol, Chancellor Carlo, I cannot thank you enough. My fondest wish is reserved not for myself, but for the well-being of this complex. There should be only good, if not great things to come, regardless of the outcome. That is our strength as a community. We are small and growing, but we are immensely influential. And we must acknowledge our work is an imprint on the very fabric of our national life. We must be deeply concerned about the leadership and the quality of leaders we inspire. As the breeding ground of thinkers, policy makers, adjudicators, regulators, what we do, what we impart to them in the way we lead ourselves is important. I accepted this nomination with all humility, knowing the weight of its implications and the belief that with this community's engagement, I can model the leadership we deserve and the leadership of the future. Maraming maraming salamat po. Mabuhay ang UP Law. Naway gabayan tayo ng may kapal. Thank you very much to our nominees. Before we proceed with the Q&A forum, let me give you first our house rules. Anyone from the participants in Malcolm Hall Theater and via Zoom live stream may ask the questions. For the interest of time, we request your question to be short and direct to the point. Before giving your question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. All questions be answered by both our nominees. And each nominee will be given a maximum of three minutes to answer each question. By the way, we have at least an hour for Q&A. <coughs> For those who wish to ask questions, you may fall, you may start falling in line to our designated microphones or microphone. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Attorney Berberabe and Attorney De Vera to join us here on the states. And we also had initial agreement earlier with the members of the search committee that the committee can also participate in the Q&A. So anyone who would like to ask question, please. Good afternoon, I'd like to start. Please. I'm attorney Froilin Pagayatan. I'm a senior lecturer of the UP College of Law. I'm also law education specialist of the information and publication division of the UP Law Center. Our division is engaged in the publication of uh, books of usually our faculty members, including the books that were written by the late Professor Baviera, as mentioned by Mom Gwen earlier. My question is, uh, what plans do you have, if any, with respect to the publications of the UP Law Center? Can we request Professor Beberabe to answer first? to be followed by uh, okay. Professor De Vera. So uh, for, the, for, the of, for your office, so we, of course, uh, I have to check 
first, for example, the funding that you, um, that you receive. And um, if there are um, needs in terms of equipment or people, uh, that will go into the um, organizational review that I was pushing for because based on my uh, engagements uh, in the previous days, so most offices in our UP law have challenges in terms of personnel, in terms of equipment, and uh, my, um, my idea is to, of course, secure the funding for your office through the legal, legal research fund and if that will be, if that will take a bit of time, also to solicit funds from the private sector. Because some, um, some of the feedback that I got are, uh, the needs are for, for example, certain equipment. So not uh, big items, not big ticket items that could easily be secured from engagement of our alumni who are very, very much willing to, to donate. And uh, one of our plans in the Alumni Relations Office is really to institutionalize that donation giving. So there is a website that is going to be set up, uh, just like in Harvard and in Yale, where you could click a uh, give a gift or donate to. However, the important thing there in order for it to be implemented well is to identify how much is needed, what are the equipment, um, what are the equipment needed. So define the definition of the project. Okay? So we identify what is needed so that we can match with a, with a donor. So, but of course, we also have um, a lot of uh, resources from the Legal Research Fund that could be tapped. But I understand that there are certain, um, certain maybe challenges in order to access it. If not, the alternative is to secure um, funding from a private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Thank you, Attorney Berberabe. Thank you, Dean Chulkipli. Maraming salamat dun sa tanong na yun, ano? Kasi uh, I think just in the last month, we've been actually thinking about uh, research and publication, uh, particularly at the Institute of the Admi for the Administration of Justice, where we just hosted um, a workshop for a future publication. It will not be published with our IPD, uh, but with another publication, but that was really inspiring in terms how we, of how to do it. So if I understand the question, I think the response will have to be in two parts. One is encouraging faculty to do the research, and the next is enhancing the capability of our IPD to disseminate and publish. Publication is very important for our UP Law Complex because publication is the way that we disseminate our research and make accessible legal knowledge and legal information. So those are the two things that we will be looking at. Um, and I'm very happy to say that's something that we've already started. So we're hoping that by next year, we'll be able to invite again our resource persons to do a research workshop for our faculty. That's both regular and uh, um, lecturers in order to capacitate them to undertake research, including the preparation of a research agenda, undertaking the research, and understanding what are opportunities for dissemination apart from publication, but most certainly in publication. So, uh, madalas po kasi akong visitor dun sa book room where I think a number of our publications uh, are displayed. So I was very happy to see one that was authored by, um, I think she is our lecturer at the LLM program, si uh, attorney Johanna Lorenzo, Hannah Lorenzo. And I was very happy to see that it was a monogram, monograph that had been published. So, yon. so just to uh, summarize po, 
I think we need to enhance uh, faculty, encourage faculty interest in research, and then determine our resources in the IPD that will make possible the publication and dissemination of faculty research. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? If still none from the audience, there is a question from someone who is anonymous. Question to both our nominees. First, are you aware and prepared to handle administrative problems that are a major responsibility of a college dean? Number two, what administrative problems do you think are unique to the UP Diliman campus that may happen when you are the dean? Number three, you have the confidence to deal with these problems. Professor Berderabe? I think uh, that the position of dean is uh, the most part of the role is being an administrator. So I believe that um, administrative skills, management skills are very important for the one who will be the next dean. Okay? That is respected as well by the academic community and that is respected by the, the UP community. Okay? Now what are the administrative uh, challenges that I imagine will be encountered by the next dean. Okay. Um, since 1970s, so it, the, the, the plantilla or the organization has never been reviewed since the 1970s and I think that that's really uh, one of the priorities uh, of the next dean. And it is very difficult to push for an organizational review and to implement the, the reforms because it isn't just dependent on UP law. It is dependent on uh, the UP system as well as the Department of Budget, the DBM. Okay? So that means that the next dean has to have the skill on knowing which buttons to press, who are the people who are the relevant decision makers that should be tapped or reached out to in order to make things happen. Okay? So uh, another, uh, another issue that I think will be encountered by the next dean in the administration is, of course, how do we, we were always talking about recruiting and develop, developing faculty members. So as Professor Gwen also said, our number of faculty has ballooned to more than uh, 200, but well, we need the quantity and we need also the quality to keep, to maintain the quality because that will really be the, the vital factor in providing superior legal education. So, but of course, all of us know that each faculty member here, bawat isa sa atin ay parang tayo ang pinakamatalino at pinakamagaling. So, for the administrator to be able to uh, maintain that quality uh, and um, um, developing our faculty and making sure that we have the optimal number and uh, quality of faculty will be a big challenge to the next uh, um, the next dean. So, meron po ba akong nakalimutan? Would you have the confidence Ay, to deal okay. with these problems? Um, I think that um, uh, I, I am very, very much confident with the uh, experience that I had in government because uh, I had the privilege and honor of being the CEO uh, of Pag-ibig Fund for six years and two months. Uh, not only by occupying such role, but having uh, tangible and uh, tangible results. Uh, and the performance was rendered with honor and excellence. Thank you, Pop. Thank you. Professor De Vera. Maraming salamat po. Uh, thank you po dun sa question na yon. Uh, kahit po siya ay anonymous. So, uh, isa-isahin po natin. No? So, are you aware and prepared for administrative problems? Yes. 
One, because I have my ear to the ground. And two, because this community has been so generous in the past few days uh, that before I even decided to accept the nomination that had been offered to me, I thought that I needed to listen to uh, members of the community in order to inform that decision. And my own readiness to say that I can serve as the next dean of the UP Law Complex. So, nanggaling po ito mismo sa community. And these are just a few. Of course, as I'd mentioned, and you'll see that I've addressed them in the plan of action. So, halimbawa po, on the faculty, kailangan po siguro talaga natin magdagdag ng permanent items considering our growth traje trajectory. Sa atin naman pong reps at non-academic, gaya po nabanggit ko kanina, uh, kailangan po nating tingnan if we can have a career path for non-permanent personnel if we can do a competency audit, because if I understand it correctly, no, dun sa, uh, those who generally sh generously shared uh, their thoughts, I think our last reorg was in 1989. No? So baka timely na din, na din po yon. So uh, in terms of addressing these administrative problems, I think what's important is understanding the uh, processes that we will need to undertake in order to accomplish them. So that includes, as Attorney Berberabe mentioned, uh, looking at who are the stakeholders and decision makers when you wish to undertake that kind of change. Uh, and number two, uh, understanding how we can navigate that process. And who better to do that than the UP Law Complex? Because we are thinkers and problem sol solvers. But most of all, as lawyers, we are not only problem solvers, we take action. No? So we, we, take la we uh, reach a sound judgment and we take uh, definitive action. And do I have the confidence? Yes. And when I say that, it's to reassure that community that yes. Um, I can assure you we, we will be in good hands because our idea is to establish collegial decision making to address these serious problems. And also because my immediate past experience have helped me to identify and, and um, commit to the readiness to address them. One, I've already been an academic leader and administrator as a former dean of the Manuel L. Quezon University School of Law. At mahalaga po yun, nabanggitin na no, dahil uh, nagpapasalamat po ako sa tiwala na Manuel L. Quezon University School of Law dahil Nung ako po ay manungkulan sa akin nila bilang dean, ito po yung panahon na lilipat po sila mula sa Quiapo papunta ng Quezon City. No? At kinangan pong ayusin din ang enrollment. At siguro po just to close, bilang papasalamat ko din po sa aking Philippine Competition Commission family where I served as the inaugural executive director. Those who have administrative roles, alam niyo po siguro kung gaano hindi madali. No? At lalo na for a young agency. But I credit the men and women hardworking of the Philippine Competition Commission who also helped guide me uh, and helped me learn uh, what it takes in order to be an administrator. So, maraming salamat po. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nick Castro. I'm a third year student here at UP Diliman, UP Law Diliman. Uh, I have two questions, uh, medyo unrelated, pero uh, I think very important. First is, uh, on the part of the candidates, would you feel that the, whether the process or the period for consultation with the stakeholders is sufficient? Because as I remember, kahapon na announced yung call for interviews with the stakeholders. So... And I think midterm season then of all, most of us now. So kaya konti yung mga tao here in Malcolm Hall. And uh, the second one is we have three campuses now. So Deleman, BGC, and Iloilo. So what are your plans um, to integrate and ensure the quality of one UP law among the three campuses? Thank you. Professor Beberabe. Ah, okay. So, um, on the reasonable, if there is, if this amount of time is reasonable, okay, so, um, like for me, 
marami akong in, in, the, in the past days, medyo marami akong sunod-sunod yung engagement with individual faculty members, uh, non-academic staff, uh, other stakeholders, parang in a span lang of uh, uh, one and a half weeks, ang dami ko nang nakuhang information. So, uh, with, with this amount of time, of course, we could have a longer time, but if this time is really maximized and really the stakeholders take active participation and the search committee, I, I, I suppose, I will defer, of course, to the wisdom uh, as well of uh, our UP president and the chancellor for, for the time that uh, they are giving this. If you just um, really put to full use each day, I think uh, this is a reasonable amount of time. And, and I thank everyone who is participating in this stakeholder engagement. Now, how do... What, what are my thoughts on the integration? Because we have UPBGC, UP Iloilo, and then UP Diliman. You are correct in identifying that there are really challenges. Last weekend, I was in uh, Iloilo uh, with the UP Law Alumni Foundation and has witnessed the really the growth of uh, the UP presence. It has been three years, and we have almost 100 uh, students. Uh, we are sending our faculty from Diliman to Iloilo. Uh, share, we are also sharing our faculty in BGC. So there, there are challenges. Uh, always in any new program, there are challenges, uh, birthing pains. Okay? So, but if the dean and uh, there is support of uh, the office of the chancellor and support of the UP, of the UP president, I think that uh, it is not an insurmountable problem. Okay, so the important thing is there is constant coordination of what are the needs of each uh, unit and keeping in mind, again, the quality of education that we should maintain what we ha are traditionally uh, used to, which is the Malcolm Hall uh, quality of education. So... Uh, constant coordination, identification of problems, and solutions by the dean and the, and the leadership team will be key in order to integrate the three units. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Berberabe. Thank you very much uh, for, that, uh, for that question. So on the first one, um, if from the perspective of the community, the period for consultation and uh, finding out or learning more about the candidates in, in, is inadequate based on what we've learned earlier. No? So I think the decision will be made on November 30. Um, ako naman po, any time po that you'd like to discuss anything, I will make myself available to you. Let's not make the uh, amount of time that is remaining a challenge. If the community wishes to discuss, wishes to uh, collaborate, wishes to surface additional issues, or simply wishes to get to know me uh, because you are thinking deeply about uh, the deanship, then please let me know. I will make myself available to you. This is how important the law complex is to me. So, uh, hindi po hadlang yung iksi ng panahon. Lalo na po dahil sa sarili kong experience, no? uh, isa't kalahating linggo lang po, uh, uh, marami na rin po akong nakausap at uh, I'm reliant on the generosity of this community. And in return, uh, that is my invitation to you. If, you. if you wish to talk to me, if you wish to discuss in relation to the deanship, then please just let me know. Um, on the second question, Diliman, BGC, and Iloilo, I cannot underscore the importance of integration. Um, I did not speak to many students from our BGC campus, but from the few that I did talk to, I gathered that, or I had the impression that they did not feel they were part of one UP law complex. So that integration is important because UP Diliman, UPBGC and UP Iloilo are all 
one college of law. These are all extension classes. But in terms of, and I think what you've seen also is the importance of supporting the, uh, the extension classes in Iloilo with provision of facilities. No? But apart from that, I think the offer that I make with respect to collegial leadership and decision making is what will be important in taking a decision on the future of our extension classes. Okay? So, kaya ina underscore ko po kanina yung kahalagahan no reinstituting those governance mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, hello. I am um, Diego Agabin. I'm a fourth-year law student, and I'm representing the um, law student government. Um, I actually have a few questions I'd like to ask, um, and if time permits, I would last. I would like to ask all of them, Sana. Um, my first question is: um, So some students have raised the concern that a shortened semester is detrimental to learning, especially to law school students. Uh, do you have plans or do you envision um, adjusting the academic calendar in order to address this need? So uh, that's my first question and maybe peden sagutan na muna then before I follow up with my next questions. Thank you. Hindi baka po pwedeng mauna muna si Prof. para makapag-isip po ako ng sagot. Okay. Pwede, pwede. Ah. Sige po, uh, Professor De Vera. Opo. Sige po. Maraming salamat, uh, Jego, no? Tama, Jego. So, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're referring to as a shortened semester is the impact, particularly this semester, of the reading break, and then subsequently the uh, yung break natin for All Souls and All Saints. No? So, if we're speaking of the academic calendar, I think um, on the law school side, including from some of our professors, uh, we're hoping that we can keep the academic calendar without the reading break. No? Uh, particularly because we have now... So one of the things that I actually wanted to, to share is we've come out of the pandemic, but we haven't really discussed what is the new normal for us. So the reading break was uh, a solution that I think was very helpful during the pandemic, but which I think we should rethink now that we are uh, out of that pandemic. So my perspective on that is given our various courses and the uh, length of the materials that we have to cover, I think the appeal is not only on the part of the students but also on the part of the teaching community in terms of ensuring that the calendar is adequate for us to complete our courses. Sa akin naman, uh, Diego, so uh, I think there are several factors that uh, need to be taken into account. Okay? Um, uh, the situation of the students, of course, so what I'm hearing from you is that mukhang ang mas uh, preferred ninyo ay wag ma-shorten. Okay? So, so status quo. And in, in, in any change, uh, I think the, so the, the question that has to be asked is uh, what is the purpose of shortening? Okay? So aside from the su student situation, the faculty as well, okay? so because they are an important stakeholder. And uh, also, kung ano naman yung impact doon sa mga kukuha ng uh, bar exam. Okay? So kasi yung tapos ng uh, semester until the, the bar exam will also be... Uh, Will, will also be very important and that has to be taken into account. So, uh, for me, kung paano ako mag-decide uh, dyan is to, to get uh, the perspectives and the, um, what, the ideas of the important stakeholders in order to make a decision on that. So, for now, parang wala naman ako pang nakikita na matinding dahilan to change so unless there is a pressing uh, reason to change, then uh, we study and implement the change. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, if I may ask another question. Please. The follow-up question. 
Um, it's a separate question, bro, uh, okay. if I may. Separate. Uh, so, um, as mentioned a while ago, the acceptance rate of the college has been increasing for the past few years. Um, would you say that you plan to um, see this number increase even more in the for coming years? Or do you see that um, if there is a need to stagnate it or decrease it? Um, because um, with the increasing number of students, there also needs to be an increasing supply of um, competent um, professors. So, I guess a follow-up to that is, um, how then do you ensure that the quality of the professors we get in the college will be able to meet the needs of the college and to be able to um, live up to the standards that the college holds? Okay. Yeah. Bro, maybe okay. Another, uh, so in, in terms of, the, of increasing the number of uh, uh, students who will be admitted, so ang isang, one question that I will ask, of course, is for in the meetings with uh, other deans, because usually uh, one factor that has to be considered is how many lawyers do we, does, does our country need? Okay, so minsan, uh, uh, importanteng malaman na ilan na yung population at ilan bang abogado ang kailangan ng bansa natin. And that's why that could also influence how many students, so the, the different deans, the different leaders of uh, the uh, law schools should also have a plan on how to meet that, how to address that need. Now, number two, you already identified the issue. So if, for example, it is identified that there should be a, an increase in the number of lawyers, then there should be a, an accompanying program for how do we then find the uh, right number of faculty. So as of now, um, sometimes we are we react on an ad hoc basis. Okay, so one faculty, one uh, part time lecturer is not available for this semester. So you look for others. So there has to be like a uh, a more institutionalized way of a pool of faculty members that can be tapped. Uh, and but at the same time, so if you have that quantity, what I mentioned uh, a while ago is that there should also be a group of faculty members uh, that is looking into the credentials and to make sure that the tradition of uh, being invited by our um, uh, by the leadership of the college should really be maintained in order to. Um, keep the quality of the Malcolm education. Thank you. Professor DeBell. Thank you. So, Jego, I really appreciate that question because the students who approached me with the nomination expressed that concern exactly. And the reason I'm here is because I thought for a second year student to express that concern in terms of the quality of the legal education that the person was receiving is something very important and fundamental because that means that that student had come to us with an expectation of a certain training that could not be delivered elsewhere. So, napakahalaga nun, no? Uh, for me, there shouldn't be any conflict as far as quantity or quality is concerned. Why? Because we have guiding principles we have guiding principles not only in terms of the kind of legal education that we are mandated to deliver, we also have guiding principles about the kind of Filipino lawyer that we are supposed to produce. So we're not mass producing lawyers, we are producing lawyers of a certain caliber, and more importantly, of a certain heart. Kasi nakalagay sa guiding principles natin, dapat may consciousness ng social justice, Merong sense of fairness, my readiness to serve as a leader. No? So in the US, for example, they're saying when we train lawyers, it's not just to be a legal technician, it's not just to go into a particular legal field, but we're assuring the community, we're assuring the nation that this person who has this legal training can be an effective business leader, can be an effective NGO leader can be effective policymaker. Okay. So what's important 
is again establishing, and, and I can say this readily because I have served as a faculty member on our admissions committee as well as our appeals committee. And in the time that I've served on the admissions committee, I truly appreciated the academic leadership that permitted the faculty to look into how serious admissions policy is and uh, to make the admissions uh, decision uh, for every academic year. Okay, thank you. Sir, compete pa. Maybe final, final question. <laughs> Uh, I guess my final question is, um, despite the broad academic freedom given to the multiple professors we have here, uh, will there be any measures to hold professors accountable in terms of transparency on how grades are computed, um, especially to those students who were either failed or given a low grade for the class? Professor Berlabe. Ah, Okay, so... Um, just like any self-regulating body, so we don't usually want like uh, there's there's a uh, a set of behavioral conduct that has to be dictated on people. Okay, so because our premise is we recruit faculty members who have that certain quality that uh, Professor Gwen has mentioned and that we already have guiding principles. Okay? So we have that um, good set of people, but what I'm hearing from you is that, okay, so what about for uh, erring faculty members? Okay? So I, I believe that if there are issues that are uh, brought up, that, ha that those issues have to be investigated and checked on whether there, there are, they, are, they have basis, they are true, and, whether, and how can we address because it will also affect the, the name, the reputation, and the values that we are espousing. So I did include in my visions and plan the culture of integrity and professionalism, which I think should start from our college. If we demand for our graduates to render public service with honor and excellence, and if our students could not find it in the very college that they are studying, then that will be meaningless. And it will be hard to demand from our students what we cannot, uh, what we cannot see and observe in our own college. Thank you. Professor De Vera, please. Hey, maraming salamat po. Um, what a challenging question, but I think it's an important question uh, for discussion. No? So first off, I'd like to assure the community, especially the students as a faculty member, that our deans, and I, I think this began during the time of uh, Dean and now former president Danilo L. Concepcion. So we receive what's called a notice of appointment. And in that notice of appointment, we receive instructions in terms of what we should uh, provide to students. And that includes, of course, our syllabus of instruction, which should provide uh, the manner by which the grades will be provided. So we do have that mechanism or institution um, in the college. Number two, one other thing uh, that uh, one of our immediate uh, past academic leaders in which uh, Chancellor Vistan as our dean continued was the creation of the assistance to the dean uh, on student affairs. So I share that role with uh, Professor Jackie Espinilla. Um, and I can share with you that during the pandemic, this was particularly difficult. Not that we were not together, uh, very difficult to escalate issues. Um, uh, so it involves close coordination for now between the office of the dean and the law student government. And at the time, that conduit was uh, established through the assistant to the dean on student affairs. And I thought that that was effective. Um, uh, I hope that Professor Espinel will agree. So in one instance, um, that was exactly the issue that had been 
uh, submitted to us by an entire block. Um, and after consultation with the block, we thought that it was something that the dean, it, it ought to be escalated to the dean because the dean is also the dean of the faculty for the dean to then determine. No? Kasi yung role ng dean as academic leader and as the unifying leader of the faculty is really twofold. It will be difficult for the dean to immediately impose uh, some disciplinary action on faculty if in the very beginning there was never any mentorship offered to the faculty. No? Kaya nga sinabi natin kanina, mahalaga yung onboarding. No? So, dalawa, mahalaga yung, for our students, you know, teaching is a very rewarding form of legal practice. And we can get started, we can get you started on it here in the law school. No? And uh, isang ang initiative niya ng Institute for the Administration of Justice ay umpisahan uh, sana yung MCLE, even for non-lawyers. Non no? Yung pangalawa, um, is offering that mentorship between senior faculty and younger faculty so that we avoid um, these types of issues arising. Particularly because meron naman tayo ng guidance on that. And number three, siguro, I will draw from what Attorney Perperabe mentioned earlier na kailangan nakikipag-collaborate din naman tayo sa mga ibang mga law schools. No? So, um, I know that my time is up and I'll ask Attorney Perberabe and Dean Wadi if I can just have one more minute to share this story. No? So, while I was a lecturer, I taught at the Ateneo Law School. So, and this was after already having taught here for more than 20 years. So, I taught, I think, two semesters at the Ateneo. In my first semester teaching at the Ateneo, and I, my students, some of whom are here, know that I'm very transparent in terms of how the grades will be determined. No? Um, short of already giving you the Excel file so you can determine if indeed I've computed it correctly. So, ang challenge ko lang talaga math. No? Uh, pero yung, ano yung uh, components of the grade, I, I will let you know. If you want to discuss the exam questions, I will also, I normally discuss it with the class. So again, in Ateneo, for my first semester, at the end of the semester, we were briefed. No? So we were briefed by Dean Joey Hofelenia on what are the rules around um, complaints in relation to grades and checking of examinations. So when you're told what happens, you know, you've been teaching for 20 years, you don't think, ah, oh, okay. But at the end of my first semester, I receive an email from of the office of the dean saying that one of the students has asked for the examination score that I gave to be reviewed. And that was the first time that I learned that they had an entire process for doing so. So first step of the process is the student who is complaining that his examination may have not been fairly corrected will have to go to a committee composed of students. That committee will then request from the office of the dean that the instructor provide a copy of the examination. After which, the copy of the examination and the uh, examination booklet if the committee finds that it is meritorious to do so, will be referred to another faculty member just for determination if indeed uh, there had been any uh, unfairness in that uh, checking. And at the end of it, of course, um, hindi naman nagtuloy. No? So I think the finding was that uh, the question was fair and the answer was fairly uh, graded. No? But we can learn from others. Uh, kasi hindi naman natin dapat, um, when systems are good, they are worth sharing, right? And I think that is our unique role as the College of Law of the National University. At ito naman, uh, kaya kong ibahagi sa inyo dahil ito naman ang inimpart ni uh, Senior Associate Justice Marvick Leonen, nung siya naman na naging dean. No? So he gathered us and he said, I want to see yung inyong mga curriculum. Kasi kailangan mag, makibahagi tayo sa improvement ng legal education outside of the University of the Philippines College of Law. So why don't we publish our curriculum for the benefit of uh, not only instructors but also law schools outside of uh, Metro Manila. So I hope that addresses your 
uh, your question. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, so thank you so much. Final question. <laughs> so, from other, yes, please. Uh, good afternoon po. Uh, I'm Lance Trevor El Cladera and my standing is actually, uh, as they say, super senior. I've been here since 2015 actually. <laughs> um, yung concern ko po is my experience kasi uh, uh, now, right now, I'm actually not formally enrolled nor on leave kasi pinaprocess pa yung enrollment ko. Waiting the response of particularly two professors na hindi pa nag-respond for more than a month. And uh, the original root cause of the problem was conflict between the interpretation of rules of enrollment between, by the administrators, particularly the OCS, and the OUR. In both 2022 and 2023, I was delayed twice. Uh, if Mom Gwen de Vera remembers, I am your student in martial law uh, jurisprudence and I was not able to attend her part of the class. That was because of the delay. And um, at, in both cases, uh, it was upheld that the OUR was correct. Uh, in the interpretation, and that was my original filing. But the delay has cost me um, many months of rent, uh, many months na ang nangyari ho is I will have to contact professors uh, and the OCS would not handle na parang sabi nila, we cannot help you with that, you have to contact your professors na, which could have been avoided if they, were, they had the rules correctly in the first place uh, para hindi na wala ng conflict. So right now po, um, we have had experiences na uh, hindi uh, sinasagot or hindi available yung administrators. And uh, both of you have already answered uh, my first question, yung availability po ninyo to, con to consult. Uh, but I would like to ask Anna if that extends to, under your new administration, if that would extend to all uh, staff of the, let's say, uh, Office of the Dean, Office of the Associate Dean, and the OCS. Because we have had cases cases when we were turned away or that uh, they said na wala si ganito or uh, rather the word was we cannot meet any administrator during that day. Uh, that was very alarming and threatening to a student. And I guess my, uh, my, sec my other question would be if, um, uh, if but how would you uh, rather have a dialogue with the law student government? How would you treat the law student government as representative of the student body in the College of Law? And can I ask for a guarantee that they will not be treated as, um, if you will allow me to speak in Filipino, if they will not be treated as utusan or tautauhan, which has been my experience or my observation since 2015 and has been um, very uh, problematic and uh, very burdening to them in their um, duty to represent the student body. Because both of you said that you, will, you are willing to meet students, talk to them, but I assure you that most students would not do that and they will course it through the LSG. So I would like to ask some guarantees on how you would deal with them or uh, I guess if you could at least guarantee that you will not treat them as um, utusan or uh, tautauhan lang po. Okay. Thank you po. Professor Berdarabe. Okay. Um, First, I am sorry to hear about your unfortunate uh, experience. Ano? Um, she, minsan, pagka nagkakaroon tayo ng, ng problem, uh, talagang nagiging challenge minsan yung sino ba ang pwedeng uh, dulugan na makakatulong. Okay? So, minsan dun pa lang sa first step na yon, pag uh, na, hindi natin alam kung sino, eh di nagkakaroon na kaagad ng uh, breakdown of uh, process na sana ma-address kaagad yung, yung uh, mga issues. So, uh, ako kasi naniniwala talaga sa um, processes should be in place uh, and if if you if that process fails, there has also to be a periodic review of all the processes. Parang si wag masyadong mahaba ang process ang uh, time to review the processes an annual uh, review could be uh, enforced so that what is the purpose of that so that the leadership could identify which processes should 
be refined or should be stopped or should be revised. Okay? So, uh, doon, gusto ko lang sigurong, uh, parang inisip ko lang kanina, uh, si student government ba hindi rin nakadulog uh, on your behalf. Okay? So, para tamang tao ka agad. So, minsan, the swirl uh, will worsen the situation, but uh, I'm sure kung, kung naidulog natin sa uh, tamang office, baka naniniwala naman ako ng ating mga uh, leadership uh, um, officers will will hear you out okay now number two on your number two question uh, ngayon ko lang na rinig naman yung feedback na parang okay this is the reaction of the students na uh, ito yung nagiging pakiramdam na tautauhan uh, I, I am a strong believer and I'm sure uh, Professor Gwen also did mention it in, in her uh, platform I think it is very important to engage talaga the stakeholders, especially the students, faculty, non-academic staff, the stakeholders outside. Bakit? Kasi kung ikaw administrator, proud ka na ang galing mong mag-solve ng problema, pero pag hindi mo alam ang problema, paano ka makakapag-solve? Eh, ang yabang mo, ang galing mo, pero hindi mo pala alam. Paano mo malalaman? And that is by having dialogues, periodic dialogues, and the, the line should be open. So it is very important that the leaders should be approachable as well. Minsan kasi may leaders na parang kakahiyang, nakakahiyang lapitan or naku, parang baka matanggihan. Uh, and as Filipinos, minsan that becomes a barrier. Okay. So at na, ako naman, palagi ko makikita ka natin at masasabi na kami pareho ni Professor Gwen, tingin ko, um, that will not be a problem. And both of us are very open and uh, to dialogue and we welcome it. Thank you. There's, I think, another question, first question on conflict of interpretations uh, between OUR and uh, College Yes, uh, kasi po OUR actually described uh, mm. their exact words when I called them na ah, ganyan, kalaga kasi yung College of Law may sariling rules. They were referring to the fact that we are the ones, uh, mm. or rather the OCS was the one assigning the subjects. And I'm sure there's reason for the rule, pero in the process, that hampered them from fixing the problem. And um, they were surprised that and we were even... you're saying that you are affected. The students, yes. in this case, uh, were affected yes. because of this conflict yes. of... Uh, Interpretation uh, that's that's the word. Po. May sariling rules daw po ang College of Law. And I'm not saying that the rules are wrong per se, but rather it has pro, uh, impact on other problems like problem solving ng enrollment. Mm -hmm. Professor Berberabe, do you want to comment on that one? Uh, well, uh, parang ang nakikita ko kasi dun sa problem na yon sana ay uh, kung na-identify lang talaga na meron lang ako, may isang tayong sudyante na kailangan. So the, the relevant persons, had they talked, uh, I think that uh, the, the issues could have been resolved um, on a timely fashion. And I'm, uh, I'm very sorry that you had to uh, endure the situation and I think parang sabi mo nga nag made, made damage pa, pa sa iyo. So again, uh, engagement and um, tapping uh, the, right, uh, the right resource or the right officer for, for our problems. Professor Rivera? Nako, naalala ko yung dinaanan natin doon sa klase na yun, ano. Uh, and, and I share uh, Attorney Berberabe's sentiment that of course we hope that that could have been avoided. But, uh, and your questions are very important. I'd like to start with the second first on the LSG. So I can assure you that that would not be the case. Uh, even for me personally, as a professor, and I, I'll give you two reasons for that. The first one is, in my experience as assistant to the Dean on Student Affairs, along with Professor Espinilla, I think we did that uh, just before the start of the pandemic and through the pandemic. And I think we were, be, we were able to respond to the needs of the students as well as collaborate with the law student government. Number two, um, I think those in the law student government at the time that we had an opportunity to um, speak with, to problem solve with, will attest that that was never the case, uh, at least as far as Professor Espinilla and I were concerned. Um, in fact, and dami naming dinaanan non with them, no? kasi yon yung 
may pandemic tayo tapos nagkaroon ng baha. No? So yung immediate na pangangailangan, mga nawalan ng computer, walang kuryente, hindi makapag-online classes. No? So, and we thanked the LSG for coordinating the efforts on the part of the students kasi sila yung naglo-locate uh, sila yung nagtatabilit kung ano yung kailangan. Kailangan ba financial? Kailangan ba extra computer? Kailangan ba ng bagong libro? Kailangan ba magpaserox? Okay? O kung ano man yung mga uh, kailangan ba ng mga bagong libro. So that's definitely not the case. And second, uh, ito naman, I'm very proud. Kasi nga, uh, iba din naman talaga ang admissions natin. You know? So we're a professional school. So when I enter the classroom, and I used to teach first year law students. When I enter the classroom, I don't see someone who's fresh out of college. I see someone who's going to be a lawyer four or five years ahead. And because I've been teaching for so long, a number of those students I have met four or five years later, uh, either as collaborating counsel or even across the table. And when you have that frame of mind, you want them to immediately also regard you with some maturity, with the idea that I am going to be a lawyer in four or five years. Um, and so certainly, uh, no thinking at all in the area of magiging utusan, but rather uh, immediately, you know, that, that desire to offer mentorship if it will also be accepted. So let me turn to your first question, and that's an important question uh, to ask. And my response to that is uh, twofold. One again is understanding the processes, particularly with respect to registering classes. Kasi magkaiba yung offering dito at kung ano yung lumalabas minsan sa CRS. That's one. Number two, uh, this goes to our discussion earlier, which I think even Attorney Berberabe recognizes. Talagang kailangan po natin pag-isipan yung paglaki ng ating population yung kakayan na ng ating facilities to sustain it, at kasama po doon sa ating resources and facilities ang ating mga staff. So ang Office of the College Secretary po ay dalawa lang po ang permanent items dyan. Okay? Dalawa lang po ang permanent items dyan. So ano ang isang challenge sa OCS? No? So kung dalawa lang po ang inyong permanent items, ibig sabihin, uh, ang career track mo papunta ka doon sa nandun na rin. No? So, hihintayin mo ba siya na matapos para ikaw ay makapag-advance in your career? So, by the time they train people in these important processes, uh, that person will have already looked at an opportunity elsewhere. And I think we're lucky na kahit tumitingin sila ng opportunity elsewhere, they're, they're staying within the law complex. No? But that's the, the, second, uh, the second challenge. Um, and the third one is, of course, in terms of availability. So that's something to check. I'm not sure if that's availability in terms of physical presence. But again, uh, we should appreciate, no? Ang college secretary po natin, isa lang siya para sa Diliman, para sa BGC, at para sa Iloilo. No? So, and they're expected to handle record-keeping, enrollment for over 1,000 students. So, kailangan din po nila ng assistance when it comes to, for example, uh, using technology to help them. Yun lang pong student records. No? Para mapadili yung enrollment natin, kailangan na kailangan. So, uh, while we recognize that indeed that is a serious problem, and while we recognize that we can rectify it to a certain extent by working in our OCS, uh, we also appeal uh, for your understanding and patience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you, Bob. Maybe we can still accommodate uh, one or two questions. Yes. Uh. Hi, good afternoon, Po. Angelo Santiago um, from UP Law Center, IAJ. Also a senior lecturer um, teaching legal bib and um, elective on artificial intelligence. So my question is on AI. Um, I'm glad to have heard from the plan of action something relating to AI and the future. So my question po is, under your deanship, how might we train our students to be lawyers, not only in the future, but of the future? Considering that AI is already here and it, it's, abound, it, it's abundant, no? 
um, I've observed that, ako personally, I've encountered these technologies outside of law school. So, how do we equip our students? Um, are electives enough? Is it time to... Uh, medyo maraming tanong, but they, they can be answered with just one answer. Or is it time to allow students to enroll in other electives outside? Because other other units, like engineering, they, they are offering ethics on AI. So, um, that's the first question point. Second, uh, for the UP Law Center, what direction will AI uh, take under your leadership? So with respect to research um, uh, and the like. Thank you. Professor Bebedave. Uh, okay. So uh, in fact, napakaganda, napakagandang idea nung sinabi mo na uh, how do we equip the students okay, so in, in that question? And then you already, you already have an idea that maybe we can tie up with other colleges. Even in like Harvard or Yale, uh, they have joint programs, for example. So there could be collaboration between two UP units if it is not yet uh, available as of now and they have um, courses that are available. Maybe there could be a, a, a partnership between our um, be between our units, so in much the same way. So, for example, in training for for the legal extension service for training our politicians, uh, NCPAG is leading it, and uh, we could also provide resources. So, there could be partnership between uh, the two units. So, that's one. And number two, of course, uh, I I am thinking that since this is an emergent field, the research towards it the scholarship should be strategic and really specifically targeted. So we have to like identify certain junior faculty or even students who will research on this uh, topic. Hindi yung uh, bahala ka na lang kung anong gusto mo i-research. Uh, sabi nga ng ibang faculty members, pagka pinabahala mo sa estudyante, lahat mag-aaral ng commercial law or ng international law. So, but if the, co if the college decides which are the areas na kulang tayo, then i-target na natin. And then we get funding for, uh, for, for the research um, or scholarships for the students as well as faculty. Okay? So, kailangan din ng... Uh, uh, yung AI kasi, kailangan natin i-embrace. Ang daming exchange, uh, ang daming discussion sa chat group ng faculty ng UP Law, may iba na... Uh, naku, uh, Parang ayaw, ayaw yung AI, parang it's dangerous, but uh, my view is that we should embrace it, of course. Uh, it's changed, uh, even in, in my vision, parang we have to be prepared with the technological and social change, and we have to adapt. Okay, So I like your idea of you know opening up, how do we equip then our students? So if we have AI experts, uh, AI and privacy, then we develop our own um, uh, electives. Or we can start with research workshops, uh, dialogue, so that we can start the um, the, the discussion. Um, we can start the discussions and then later on develop into a subject. Thank you, okay. Professor Devera. Uh, thank you, po. Very very interesting question. So, uh, actually, mahaba sa ane sagot ko sa so iksiyan ko, kasi this is such a this is such a it's actually exciting. So AI is here. We don't have to embrace it, but we do have to recognize it is present. Okay? And in recognizing that it is present, we should also be unafraid. No? So to answer your question, I think we have to look at three things. No? The first one is AI and legal education. The second one is AI's impact in society. And the third would be in relation to our work in the law center, which of course, uh, you have helped uh, lead in the um, Institute for the Administration of Justice. So just to abbreviate, uh, I'd like to focus on AI and legal education. And the reason why I'm excited is just the other day I was talking to one of our lecturers, but who's also uh, a lawyer in the law center, si Neil Silva. No, we're talking about AI. Paano na ba yan? Um, si ChatGPT. Ngayon meron pang bago si Bard. And uh, I'm told that Bard is so much better than ChatGPT. Hindi masyado mali yung mga citations niya. So students who are here, that's not a hint that you should shift from ChatGPT to, to Bard. Um, 
But in terms of legal education, I think we should start with building awareness, particularly on the part of our faculty and also our lawyers. So yung conversation namin ni Nisa Silva was driven because um, I subscribe to this newsletter uh, that is sent out, I think, twice a year by a collective of legal writing professors in the United States. No? And one professor proposed a way to address these challenges posed by AI. So ang ginawa niya, nag-isip siya, ano ba magandang writing assignment kahit na merong AI? So, very simple solution ang ginawa niya, ang assignment niya ay, I have this, quest, this writing assignment for you. Go ahead, use the AI of your choice. But you need to submit to me whatever the AI produces and your correction. Tingnan mo, mali ba si AI? Eh, accurate ba si AI? At ano yung madadagdag mo dun sa sinabi niya? So, you have to turn in two things to me the product of the AI and your own product as a thinker and law student. So there are solutions, but I think it begins, actually, yung, yung, uh, ang lesson ko dun was the capability of collaborative work to offer these solutions. Kasi ano lang yun, eh, parang lang silang grupo ng mga legal writing professors and they, they collaborate, they talk to each other, uh, and they produce these materials. No? So they were advising in, uh, each other on teaching strategies given the, uh, the challenges posed by AI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our time uh, is up actually, but uh, um, would you mind at least from the member of the committee or as chair of the committee, if you can... Um, be willing to answer this question. Um, what is your view on the current state of democratic governance in UP? Is it in good shape? If yes, why? If not, why? And are there areas of reform or development that must be done. Professor Beberabe. Okay. Uh, democratic governance. Okay, so I would, I, first thing that uh, um, comes to mind would be like the decision making uh, in, in the UP system. So what decisions are lodged in the Board of Regents, for, for example, so if, if I look at the composition of the Board of Regents, um, so there are, the rep there's the representative for the faculty, there's a representative for students, there's a representative um, from the staff, and then um, there are also appointments coming from, um, uh, from Office of the President. So um, if you look at the composition, from Senate, from, from Congress, Office of the President, and then Chad Chairman. Um, each sector is represented. Okay? Now, the question will be, or always in any, in any structure, or in any, um, in any organizational structure, the important question to ask is, is there is the representative of a sector or, or what what is the or is the is the is the system effective for that representative to get hold of all the the opinions or the position of its sector so kumbaga are they effective as a representative of their sector in order for the decision in the BOR to be uh, really based on the sentiments of their sectors. Now, in any collegiate body, uh, in my experience, so for example, in, when I was in government, uh, my experience is that the tone that is set by the head is very, very important. Okay? So if 
uh, you have a strong head with values that he is also encouraging or fostering in the discussions in the board. Not, um, not stopping, again, very important sa akin yung discourse, not stopping different positions. And in fact, if, a, if the head will encourage such discussions, the head will be in the best position because he will be able to get different ideas and will be able to make the best decision. Kasi minsan, if the head... Um, siguro naman, wala na yung three minutes kasi si Mr. Chair na ang ano. Kasi kung yung head ay... Uh, ang gust parang yung group thinking ang gusto, yung pare-pareho lang, then even if the structure of the decision-making body, in this case the board, is properly composed, then the, the process of decision-making will have some breakdown. So I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, that always, even if um, you you, we think that it is effective, it is doing its jo its job. A periodic review and comments from the stakeholders on their on their uh, views of how uh, decisions are made because the decisions affect their daily lives. So important always to 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 get those comments so that there will be areas for improvement. So, for example, maybe there could be. Um, uh, parameters on which decisions should be made by this body and which should be made by um, certain bodies. Or if there is no expertise or there is um, a need for uh, other view, then maybe certain advisors could be engaged in order to input for the best decision making to, um, to happen. So, uh, ayun po. So, uh, in summary, I think that the composition is, uh, uh, there is representation, but of course in the process, in the tone, and in the values that are being observed by the members, that will be very important to, to make a conclusion as to whether um, the governance structure is actually effective and efficient. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Professor. Chair. Professor Dubera, please. Chair Wadi, maraming salamat po for that, for that question. It's an exciting question for me. And to answer it, I would like to say that we have an opportunity to re-examine it. And I think we in the College of Law are well placed to advise on it. When we speak of democratic governance, we are looking at organization and process, not just one or the other. So when I say we're well placed because this organizational structure, of course, is driven by first our charter as a national university and the various issuances uh, from the constituent units and down to the various colleges um, and schools. Second, in terms of the process, I think it will benefit from transparency and a sense of accountability to the community. And when I say community, that's the community, the systems community, not just the community of the UP Law Complex. I'd like to close with two thoughts. And I say that we in the College of Law are well placed. three. Because when we think of democratic governance in the UP system, I think we've had such a unique opportunity to inform it because our immediate past president is an alumnus of the college, and our current president is also an alumnus of the college. The second is, we have to look at the balance between the academic units, the constituent uh, units, and the system. What uh, we have seen is, when you look at the organizational structure as well as the process that's involved. At the very least, it's very important to preserve at the college or academic unit level, collegial governance. 
because collegial governance is at the heart of academic leadership, where your college can decide important academic and curricular questions, among others. And why is collegial governance important at the academic unit level? Kasi po baka lingit sa ating kaalaman, and I guess it starts with me. No, I, I teach constitutional law one, and I teach political law review, and one of the topics that we cover is academic freedom. No, so my students would know that. Uh, but I always emphasize the academic freedom of higher educational institutions because that's what's expressly provided in the Constitution without, however, of course, negating the academic freedom of individual instructors. Ah, hindi po nabibigyan ng emphasis. Yung collegial governance, particularly at the academic unit level, is an important way to preserve academic freedom. Dahil academic freedom ng instructor, hindi lang yon sa paggawa ng outline, kung ano ituturo niya sa classroom, but the important decisions, academic decisions that are made, are protected by academic freedom. But most universities, hindi lang naman po siguro tayo, no? most universities or academic institutions, the way that it's organized is as you move up and decision-making rises, let's say, to the system level, the decision-making is no longer really governed by collegial governance or uh, academic, uh, academic uh, administration. No? It's now governed by corporate principles. And that's the reason why we need to preserve collegial governance, at least at the academic level, precisely to offer that. So I apologize to my students. Parang check and balance yun. Yung academic unit, meron kang empowerment dal meron kang collegial governance. No? But at, also at the same time, when we speak to the democratic process, there has to be an alignment between the collegial governance at academic unit and yung malasakit ng system level to address what the academic unit needs. Okay? And not to rely on what may be strictly corporate processes that are employed in the decision making at that level. So, mahalaga pong question yan. No? Mahalagang question yan because it addresses not just the future of legal education, but really education at our national university, given its importance in our national life. So, I, I'm really grateful for that question, Pa. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Beberabe and Attorney Devera. Thank you so much. Um, and to give us the closing remarks. And a few reminders on the upcoming stakeholders interview. I'd like to call on Dean Dina Magnani. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. On behalf of the search committee for the new UP College of Law Dean, we would like to thank everybody who participated in this public forum. We believe that this forum enabled us to better know our two nominees for the deanship of the UP College of Law, Attorney Darlene Marie Berberabe and Attorney Gwen Grecia de Vera. We heard from the nominees their vision and plans for the college and how this will contribute to the college continuing commitment to academic excellence and service to the public. Let us give our two nominees a big round of applause. And before we end this public forum, the search committee would like to invite the College of Law community to join the stakeholders interview, which will be held tomorrow at the faculty lounge of Malcolm Hall. The schedule is as follows, 9 to 10 a.m. interview with the teaching staff, 10 to 11 a.m. interview with the students, and 11 to 12 noon interview with the non-teaching staff. So those who want to participate must pre-enlist. The deadline for registration is until today. If you are not able to register through the link that was initially disseminated, 
you may approach the registration table at the end of the forum. The interviewee may opt to attend the interview face-to-face -face or online for those who will join online. A Zoom meeting link will be sent to their respective email before the interview. Once again, thank you everyone and have a nice day.